Now, Psalm 136, I don't know if you noticed a, a pattern there or a common theme in this chapter, but there's, there's obviously a reason why I chose this as the, um, the opening chapter of our sermon. My sermon's title is Mercy Endureth Forever. And this is something, obviously the book of Psalms is a song book, and oftentimes when you see repetition like that, you got to remember this was put to music. This is a song. But as with all music and with songs, you know, songs are, guided, are, are designed to teach us things. And often, you know, there's a reason for the repetition as well. There's something, there's a point that's trying to be driven home. And that point we're going to be driving home this morning is God's mercy and how his mercy endures forever. And um, we see this all throughout the Bible. I was, I was doing word studies on mercy and merciful, and it's all throughout the Bible. And I just mentioned this, I think it was on Wednesday night in my sermon, you know, we have a tendency to, to really preach the hard sermons and really preach on sin because it's extremely important. And the Bible says to, to you know, rebuke sin and that it's something we, we need in order to clean up our lives. But oftentimes, you know, we, don't, we also don't want to overlook God's mercy and, and give him the praise and exaltation that's due unto him for his mercy. And when we, we understand his mercy, it's going to help to keep us humble. Um, because he's, he's given us so much mercy. Now, what I want to focus on here is to start with is God's mercy says it endureth forever. God's mercy lasts forever. And another word here that, that can be, be equivalent with mercy is God's grace. Right? I look at, I see his enduring forever, uh, an eternal mercy, the same way that we have eternal life. And the Bible says in Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. Think about every single sin that you commit, any every single sin you've ever committed in your entire life, and that you're going to commit. Every single one of those transgressions, every single one of those sins is worthy of a punishment of hell. And we often overlook that. In our lives, we have a tendency to think that, oh, well, we're humans. None of us is perfect. Yeah, of course we sin. We all sin. And we, we tend to downplay our sin because we do it so often or because so many people do it or because we live in a world that's full of sin. And we need to be mindful of the fact that every single time we sin, whether it be a, an impure thought, whether it be you know, telling a lie, any, any sin that we do is worthy of a punishment of being burned and tortured and tormented in an eternal hell. But the same way that once, once we're saved, once we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of those sins are forgiven. He extends mercy on us to where we deserve that punishment. We deserve to be tortured. God gives us mercy, and it's a mercy that lasts forever. That's why he gives us everlasting life. It lasts forever. It's eternal. You can never lose that. He gives us a mercy that lasts forever. It's according to his mercy that he saves us. He has, he's a God of justice. He's a righteous judge. And he says, these are my laws, these are my commandments, and this is the punishment for not obeying them. And of course, as a righteous judge, that judgment has been satisfied through the blood of Jesus Christ when he came and took the punishment in our place. So it's not that God is unjust. God is still a God of justice. Just because he shows mercy on us does not mean that his justice is not fulfilled. It was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came and took the, the entire penalty for our sins. It was paid for in full, yet God still wanted to show mercy unto us, which is why he allowed for Christ to come and take that punishment in our place and be a propitiation for our sins. Now, one thing I thought that was really interesting, that exact phrase, his mercy endureth forever. I also looked that up. Every single time that particular phrase is used, it's, it's in a song. It's in a, either a psalm itself or any other time you find that phrase in the Bible, it's a song that's sung. We see songs that David made in, in Chronicles and you know Moses sang a song and, and we see other songs throughout the Bible and the only time that phrase is used is always in a song. Now, um, we're going to get into this more tonight, but, you know, we sing as a congregation here at church, and it's important to sing praises to his name, both at church and outside of church. It's, important, it's an important aspect of our life that, that you need to have and give, on, give God that honor and that glory and respect that he deserves unto his name because of his mercy. It's something we should be rejoicing over daily. It's not something we should be 
forget about or negligent about the fact that he extends so much mercy unto us. That's why we see in this psalm that we opened up reading Psalm 136, every single verse, every single line ends with, for his mercy endureth forever. God's mercy endures forever. And that's just honor and exaltation given unto God and given him so much thanks. The very first verse, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. That's one of the reasons why we sing praises unto God. And as I was going to turn, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, because we're going to see this here in 1 Chronicles 16. A song that David sung. <clears throat> we're going to see here a song that he sung that has um, that phrase, for his mercy endureth forever in it. 1 Chronicles 16, we're going to be in verse number 7. 1 Chronicles 16, verse number 7 says, Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, Talk ye of all his wondrous works. So this is a lot of things that we do when we sing. And this is the reason why David made this psalm. He's, he's, he made this psalm to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing unto him, sing psalms, and to talk of all his wondrous works, to give him honor and praise and glory for all the wonderful, marvelous things that God has done for us, the miraculous events, all the events that God has worked in our lives. We're going to jump down to verse number 33 because this is a, this is a long song. We're going to jump down to this point in verse 33. It says, Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Now look at verse 33 again. We just read this. It says, Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord because he cometh to judge the earth. You might think, well, why is there going to be singing when God comes to judge? Because normally you think of, a, you know, when God comes back to judge, that's not going to be a very pleasant time. Well, for some people it's not. You, remember, you recall, you know, Jesus Christ came the first time not to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's when he came the first time. Jesus Christ is coming back a second time. And that's what this song is referring to in these verses. Jesus Christ's return. And he's going to come back to judge the earth. Now, the Bible says here that, that the trees of the wood, they're going to sing out at the presence of the Lord because he's coming to judge. And then it follows that up real quick with, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endureth forever. All of us who are saved, it's going to be a time of great joy and rejoicing when Jesus Christ comes back to judge the earth. For one, we know that God's mercy endures forever, which is why, you know, we have everlasting life. So when he comes back, you know, even regardless of what state we're in, we know that we're going to be, we're going to be taken home. We know that his mercy endures forever forever and ever and ever. So every sin that we've ever done, hey, what, since we're saved, they've already been forgiven. When he comes back, he's going to take us. But the other reason it's going to be a joyous event for us is because when Jesus Christ comes back, it's going to be a, a time of extreme tribulation and trouble and persecution to all saints. We're going to be going through the times of our life, assuming Jesus Christ comes back in our lifetime. But even if it's not in our lifetime, whoever is around, the saints that are around at that time, the saved of the earth, are going to be going through a period of tribulation unlike the world has ever seen. So when Jesus Christ comes back, every saint is going to be thankful. We're going to be, thank God he's coming back to judge the earth. Because you're going to be persecuted wrongfully. You're going to be, you know, people are going to be martyred. They'll be put to death. You're going to be going through all kinds of troubles and tribulations. Hey, when you're the one being persecuted, when you're the one having things happen, you're going to rejoice in a, in a good judge that's going to make things right. He's going to step in and say, no, enough of this. He's going to come back and we're going to be rejoicing over that. And, and even people in heaven, because you see the injustices of the world going on, of the reprobates, of the, of the false accusers, of the, you know, the people of this world that are going to be just attacking the, the Christians. 
God's going to come in and set things right. Hey, what a joyous time that's going to be. Joyous for us for two reasons. One, because he's going to be merciful to us. We've received his free gift. His mercy endures forever. But for number two, because like it said here in verse 35, save us, O God, of our salvation and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen. He's going to deliver us from the heathen. He's going to deliver us from the Antichrist and those that are with the Antichrist going out and persecuting God's children. <clears throat> so here we see God the judge coming back. Now a judge <clears throat> can show mercy in two places. We're going to segue into it. You know, just, just think about a judge giving mercy unto someone. A just judge isn't going to have no punishment whatsoever. But, but God is able to have mercy in the severity of the punishment for wrongdoing. So even though, think about this, even though our sins have been paid for eternally through the blood of Jesus Christ, it does not mean that we do not continue to need to seek God's mercy. Right? Now, we only need to seek God's mercy one time in the eternal punishment for our sins. The fact that Jesus Christ paid for our sins, we need to get that settled one time when we put our faith in Christ. But see, God, God, doesn't, um, God doesn't forgive us in the, in the temporal sense, in the, in the sense that you know, if we continue to do wrong, the Bible still says that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So when we go out and we sin, we live a wicked life, hey, as a child of God, as a son of God, he's going to discipline us in this lifetime. And that's the best analogy to use once you're already saved. You know, you're not going to be judged eternally for your sins, but you are going to be chastened and disciplined. Right now, we want to go. We need to go to God and seek His mercy as our Father. Oftentimes, you think of, um, you know, your children, and this is the best example that we can use to to understand God is with our own children. They transgress our laws. They they don't always follow our rules and our commandments. And of course, when they when they disobey, they need to be punished. They need to be disciplined. Now. What are you going to be more likely to show mercy to a child that's just stiff-necked and rebellious and doesn't want to listen to a word you have to say, and then when they break the rules, just, just blow you off? Are you going to, are you, do, you, do you really believe that a, a parent is going to sh extend a lot of mercy in that situation? No, of course not. They're going to probably begin a, a more severe punishment, a more severe beating. But when the child understands they've done wrong, and they have a repentant heart and they can go to you and say, I'm sorry. You know, I, 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 I know I've done wrong. I've broken your commandments. I, I shouldn't have done that. And I, I you know, I, I'm not going to do it again. I, I know that it's wrong. Well, you're a lot more likely to show mercy in the punishment that you give. It doesn't mean you're, you're necessarily going to not have any punishment, but you can extend a lot of mercy in that situation, and that's the way that we need to seek God's mercy. I think of the story of, of David. Um, well, I'll get to that in a minute here because the Bible says in... Um, I have to jump around here since I'm on this point. <clears throat> no, I don't know what it is. No, we'll go flip over if you would to... Um, Go to Jonah chapter number four. <clears throat> See, we, we need to seek God's mercy because his mercy endures forever. God, God is a God of great mercy. And if you remember the story when, when David numbered Israel, David transgressed God. David was not supposed to count the children of Israel. He was not supposed to number them. He was supposed to just have faith in God that God's going to protect them. Because normally when you number the people, you're, you're counting your troops. You're, what you're doing is you're numbering the people who are the men of war. You know, who are the people that are going to be able to stand up and defend the country and be able to fight for you? Well, God wanted David completely relying on him. He says, you don't have to worry. You know, God's going to make you as the sand by the seashore. That's the promise he made. He said, you are going to have a multitude don't count the, the people. But David transgressed. Satan um, withstood him and got him to, to sin. And he counted the people, he numbered the people. So this displeased God. He was, he was angry with that. And in 2 Chronicles 21, um, David, Gad comes to David. Gad was one of the prophets. He comes to David and he gives him a choice. And he says, look, you've, you know, basically he says, you've broken God's commandments. You need to be punished for this. 
So he gives them a choice. He gives them three choices. He says um, either three years famine. So you get three years of, of no food that's just going to plague your land. He says, or you could have three months to be destroyed before thy foes while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee. So he's saying you could just be in war and battle and just keep losing and losing and losing for three months. He says, or else um, three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. So David says, he's, you know, he knew he needed to be punished. It's going to come one way or another. But he says, let me fall into the hand of the Lord. Because I know that the Lord has great mercy. And we see in that story, too, if you keep reading, um, God does end up extending mercy. Now, 70,000 men still died. So it's still a very grievous um, you know, punishment for him. It's, it's a very grievous sin that he did, disobeying God. And that punishment came down. But as God stopped that angel of the Lord, he had the sword in his hand. And, and he stopped him at the um, at Ornan, um, the Jebusites um, place. So that's where, where the angel of the Lord, God stopped him from doing any more harm. And, and God said, it's enough because God will extend mercy. He sees, you know, David's repentant heart and, and will extend mercy unto us. Now, while God does have this extensive mercy and this an extreme long suffering, we never want to back off from either living our life or preaching what needs to be preached. And see, this is one of the problems in today's church. Is you, again, we're kind of, we're kind of trying to, to battle and combat this, this flood of people, the flood of churches that are just not willing to preach on sin in the Bible and only want to focus on the positive stuff. Now, the positive is great. I mean, God's mercy is everlasting and endureth forever. But we also need to not forget from showing people their sins. You're in Jonah chapter 4. This is the attitude that Jonah had. See, we could fall into this trap of thinking, well, since God is so extremely merciful, since God's mercy endures forever, and God is extremely long-suffering, we could get in, fall into this trap of thinking that, well, you know, it's, it's okay if we sin because God's going to be merciful. And you never want to get into that mindset of thinking, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal that I'm doing thus and so sin. It's not that big of a deal if I go and take a drink. I, God's merciful. You know, God is long suffering. God's going to no. Look at what happens in Jonah chapter four, because Jonah's upset. God told Jonah to go and to preach unto Nineveh that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Right. God's message to him. He says, look, you need to go. And just preach to the city and say that, that my judgment is coming. And Jonah didn't want to do it. Jonah fled. He, he fled from the face of the Lord. He didn't want to preach that negative message. He didn't want to go in because it's not popular. Look, if you go around saying, hey, look, God is going to bring wrath and destruction on this entire city because you're living in sin, because of your wickedness. That's not a popular message. People don't like to hear that. So Jonah was like, uh -uh, I'm not, not going to preach that sermon. And he went the other way. Well, God found him and God dealt with him by, you know, having him cast into the sea and swallowed up by a whale. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to spend three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. I mean, it makes for a great story. We love reading it and, you know, we can learn a lot from it from the Bible, but that's not a place where I'd want to spend, you know, in complete darkness in the, in the whale's belly. So God dealt with him and he finally got right and he obeyed God and preached this message. But look at his excuse. He gives an excuse for why he did that. Jonah uh, chapter 4, look at verse number 1. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repented thee of the evil. 
He had the wrong attitude. And he still had the wrong attitude, saying, well, look, I knew that you're a God of mercy. I knew that you're long-suffering. That's why I didn't even want to go and preach the message. But look, would the people of Nineveh have been saved if he hadn't have preached that message? No way. Why in the world would, I, would they have gotten right with God all of a sudden unless somebody came, unless a man of God came to point out their sins and say, hey, look, God is very angry with you and he's going to destroy this entire city because you've sinned. They didn't even know that, that God would extend that mercy. They just said, we're going to get right with God. We're going to repent. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. They fasted and they mourned over their great sin and they got right with God, which was the whole purpose of that message. But we can't just ignore the message and say, well, I'm not going to preach it because God's a God of great mercy. It doesn't make any sense. Yes, he's a God of great mercy. We see that in this story. He mercifully repented of the evil that he thought to do unto the city of Nineveh, unto the people of the city. He repented. Now, that's a, that was a great destruction coming their way, which was great mercy that God extended on them, even though they deserved it. They were living in all that wickedness, but God saw their repentant heart. God saw their change in their attitude and change in their actions. And he decided to extend mercy unto them, but it didn't come until the man of God was able to preach that hard message that needed to be delivered. So don't ever, you know, and, and that's why these churches, I think they focus on God's mercy and they think that, you know, well, we'll just talk about that because it's, because it's true. I mean, it, it is true. God's mercy is great. But you're not going to see that mercy until you get right with God. He's not going to extend the mercy just for no reason whatsoever. It doesn't come causeless. We need to make sure that we're doing the right things in order to receive that mercy. See, God wants us to have a humble attitude. He doesn't want us to be lived up with pride. He also doesn't want us to think, oh, sin's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's not a problem. The Bible says um, in Micah 6, it says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. We see here that we ought to be doing what's right, living righteously, doing justice, justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with thy God. And um, as God has shown mercy on us, we also need to extend that mercy unto others. You think about your sins being completely forgiven. You think about the fact that even though you deserve that punishment of hell, Hey, God extended a mercy unto you. And in so many other cases, when you get your heart right with God and God extends that mercy unto you, we need to be mindful of that in our dealings with other people. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God will look at you and your attitude and the way you deal with other people when people slight you, when people do you wrong. If you're able to extend mercy unto those people, God will see that and say, okay, I can see you're, you're being merciful here. I'm also going to then show mercy unto you. The Bible says in um, James 2, uh, verse 12, it says, So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So God's saying, look, I am not going to show any. Not only are you going to get mercy if you're merciful unto others, he says, if you don't show mercy, I will not be merciful unto you. So if you decide just not to be merciful in your actions when people do you wrong, um, or even in other cases when, you know, Possibly when, you're, when your child is extremely repentant or, or whatever. If you're in a position to show mercy. And see, here's, here's the thing with, with, with giving mercy or receiving mercy. It, it could only, mercy can only come from someone who has a certain power over you. Right? I mean, it doesn't just come from anybody. So, um, God obviously has power over us in everything because he's our creator and he made, you know, he made his commandments. So if he wants to extend mercy over punishment to us, he can do that because he's the one that would inflict the punishment upon us. Um, a good example would be, you know, my boss at work. He has a power over me in a certain realm, in a certain aspect. So if I screw up at work, you know, I'm a computer program. If I do something that costs the, the, the company a whole bunch of money by my mistake, you know, if I have a flippant attitude about it, if I just like, oh, I don't care. Well, he's probably going to fire me. But if I'm like, look, man, I made this big mistake. I'm sorry. I'll do what I can to make it up. You know, I, I, I didn't mean to do it and everything else. Well, probably extend mercy upon me. You know, he ought to. And 
we ought, but see, on the flip side, we ought not to be people that are just completely unmerciful where you see somebody that is, you know, they're repentant, they're sorry, they didn't mean to do it, and they're changing, and, you know, and they're, and they're really doing what's right to just be like, no, you are getting the full, you know, force of the law and, and, and the, the full force of the punishment that I can inflict upon you. You're getting it all. That would be unmerciful and, and unjust. It would be, that wouldn't be righteous for you to do. God's saying, look, Extend mercy unto others in order to obtain mercy. And if you judge without mercy, then God's going to do the same thing to you. If you're that type of a person, if you're that type of a boss, that's just going to, for every, the smallest infraction, you're getting the full weight of the law being brought upon you. That's how God's going to deal with you. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, even though God's extremely merciful, it's not just a blind mercy. He doesn't just do it for no reason. It's not at random. Um... Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter number 1. Luke chapter 1. Because <clears throat> we're going to go over some, some aspects of what we need to, to, to keep in mind if we want to receive God's mercy. The same example I just gave with children and their parents. You know, when, when they come to you with a contrite heart, well... In order for us to receive God's mercy, there's some things that we need to do. Luke chapter 1, verse number 50, Luke 1, 50, says, And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Now, why would we need to fear God? We need to fear God and keep his commandments because if we break his commandments, we know there's a punishment coming. So if we're in fear of the Lord, if we're in fear of God, that should keep us on the right path of not sinning, of not breaking His commandments, and knowing that there is a punishment associated with His sins. And if we keep that in mind, if we fear God, we'll be able to receive His mercy. Verse 51 says, He hath showed strength with His arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. These are all people who um, didn't receive mercy from God and we see why he has showed strength with his arm he has scattered the proud in the imagination of our heart so people who are proud you're not going to receive that type of mercy from God he says he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree he hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent away sent empty away he hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever and um, flip, if you would, over to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be there next. But in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He's saying, look, if you try to hide your sins, when you do wrong, if you just try to cover it up, and if you try to hide it, he says, you're not going to prosper. You're not going to grow. God's not going to bless you. He says, but if you confess them and forsake them, then God's going to have mercy on you. Luke chapter 10, we're going to see here, you know, um, most of the examples that we've seen this morning so far on God extending mercy is mostly just from, you know, breaking his, his commandments, you know, because God's a judge and he's able to judge us righteously. He's able to judge us and show mercy with that judgment. That's not the only time, though, where, where mercy can be applied. It's not just in judgment. We're going to see that with this story here in Luke chapter number 10. We're going to read in verse number 25. Luke 10, 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus gave this parable saying, well, who is a neighbor, right? And it says in verse 30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, 
and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? There's obviously this, the parable, the story of the good Samaritan. We see the priest, they see this man, he's in bad shape, and they just pass over on the other side of the street and just ignore him like he's not there. The Levite does the same exact thing. He sees him there, he's just going to pass over on the side. But this, the Samaritan comes up and he takes care of him, he helps him heal his wounds, he gets him a place to stay, and he sets him with someone that's going to take care of him, pays the way for him just to, to be um, brought back to health. And Jesus asks him, which one was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Verse 37 says, and he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. So showing mercy or extending mercy to someone, it's not just someone that you have authority over. You know, like, like if you're a boss at work or if you're a parent with your children, showing mercy unto the people. See, pe the people that walked by had a certain power over this man because he was helpless. He needed someone to help him. So in a sense, yeah, he needed someone to extend mercy on him because he couldn't help himself. And what the Bible's showing us here is that when you go out and you, you know, someone's in need like that and you're able to provide for them and help them and have that type of attitude, you're extending mercy upon them. And, and it's not just because you know, you're an authority over them or you're a judge over them. You can, re you can receive mercy or you can extend mercy unto people even in other situations when you're just helping people out. I mean, someone falls among thieves. You know, we don't know much about this story about this person that fell among the thieves, but that could happen to anybody. It's not necessarily because he was sinning or because he's being judged. Hey, sometimes sinners do bad things to other people. There's wicked people out there. They might have nothing to do with, with the way you're you'd be doing everything right. But here's a man that needed some mercy from somebody. He needed some help. Don't be like the people who just, who just ignored him and walked on by. Because God sees what's happened. Now, that, that Levite and that priest, how much mercy do you suppose God's going to show unto them when they walk by? They were in a situation to help this guy out. They could have done something to him, but they just looked the other way. And they just kept on going about their business. God's not going to show them very much mercy in their life. And, but on the flip side, you know, this Samaritan who showed mercy and, and, and really helped him out a lot. I mean, he, he kind of went above and beyond probably anything that could have been expected of him by going and healing his wounds, you know, washing him up, putting him in an inn, paying for the place to stay, and then even going further and paying the innkeeper and saying, look, Whatever else he needs, get him back up on his feet and I'll make it good. I'll make it right. I'll pay for it when I come back. That was, a, that was extreme um, mercy that he showed there. Now, um, <clears throat> we see a few more verses. I'm going to jump back. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Psalm 136 where we started up. Um, just a few more examples of, of where mercy can be applied where it says, who remembered us in our low estate in verse 23. God remembered us in our low estate for his mercy endureth forever. He hath redeemed us from our enemies. So when God saves us from our enemies, when people are persecuting, he comes and saves us. That's God showing mercy on us. Who giveth food to all flesh. So the fact that God provides for us and cares for us and feeds us is, is more mercy that's extended from God. And then, of course, I'll give thanks unto God for he of heaven for his mercy endureth forever. Um, there's a lot of aspects in our lives. And, you know, oftentimes we might get ourselves into messes, whether it's our own fault or from someone else. But we should always be praying to God for his mercy, that God's going to extend mercy on us. And the more you can live your life, in a way where you can extend mercy unto others and you're not just thinking about yourself. You can walk humbly, not be proud and thinking, oh, you're so important. You know, the priest might have been thinking, oh, I, I don't want to get my hands dirty with this guy because he's in the ditch and he's all bloody. I don't even want to get dirty because he's, you know, I have a proud attitude thinking I'm, I'm above this. We need to be humble. We need to be able to show mercy unto others and we need to pray to God that his mercy be on us and not only pray to him, but, but give thanks unto the Lord. For his everlasting mercy. So when we sing these songs, whether it be in church, whether it be at home, hey, sing them out to God. Give God the honor and the glory and the praise and respect that he deserves for his mercy. Don't be negligent. Don't be unmindful of the fact that you have all, you are a sinner and you've committed all kinds of things and you are going to continue to do more sins. 
And that every single one of those sins deserves an, a, a, a punishment of hell. But God is extreme mercy on you. And we ought to love him and thank him for that. And, and sing praises unto his name. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the mercy that you extend unto us. Dear Lord, we thank you for the eternal mercy, for, for the mercy that endureth forever through the blood of Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, we pray that you would please just um, extend mercy to us in our daily lives. Lord, help us to, um, to get through our hard times and that you, you would help us to, to not make them Help not make them so hard for us, dear Lord, but that you'd show us mercy. And God, help us not to have a proud attitude, but be humble and to be, um, be just in our dealings with people, especially people we have power over, whether to be judges or parents, and, and to do the right thing and, and, and be an appropriate judge. But at the same time, dear Lord, help us to be able to show mercy, especially unto those that have the, the repentant heart, dear Lord, and that are confessing and forsaking their sins. God, I pray that you would please just, just help us all to, to work on this aspect of our life, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.